Hey, good evening, Doc. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Ryan. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Well, well, well. We're uh, uh, doing episode four. It's kind of a kind of a, a milestone to get to a fourth episode doing this, taking care of brain business. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I, I I thought maybe people might not listen, may not know, but it was great that you told me that someone actually went to your website the other day. I think okay, so maybe I'm doing my job, <laughs> or at least some of it. <laughs> All right, let's get started. All right, so today we are going to discuss one of the brain conditions, specifically trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, uh, so from what I understand, this is a particularly painful condition, right, Doc? Exactly, and uh, the, the name, it has a very unique name. It's not something you hear very often. Um, the The name means pain that involves pain, nerve pain that involves the face. Okay. Um, let's lower the music. For yes, I guess I'm good. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the it, it is it is a very painful condition. It's relatively rare. Um, if you look at the entire population, it's uh, less than 1% of people who have this. It's typically estimated at around 0.2, 0.3%. Um, but that still amounts to a couple of hundred thousand patients in the U.S. alone. Um, it has to do with nerve pain that comes from a nerve that we call the trigeminal nerve. Okay, okay. And trigeminal means triplets. Okay. So the triplet nerve. Oh, okay. And it's it's called that way because it uh, it comes out into the face. It comes from the brain out into the face. And then it splits into three branches. Okay. Do you have any pictures of that for me? I do. All right. right. Let's. Uh, I'm going to let you, you grab this. I'm taking my share off. And you can see here, it's we have two of these nerves, one on each side, one on the right, one on the left. Okay. And they come out of the brain. This is a purely sensory nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, this is how we feel our face. Yes. At least, you know, the, the, the front part of the head. Okay. Uh, it, it also... Go ahead. It also helps uh, to innervate the some of the muscles that helps us that help us chew. Oh. Oh uh, yes, I was when I was looking around at this. Some of those nerves literally go into the teeth. They, you know, the endings of them reaching the teeth, which I guess helps us figure out like, are we biting something hard? Are we biting something soft? That sort of thing. Yeah, so, you know, you can see here three branches, and th that's the, uh, the, the, the triplet part of the name. Okay. And one branch goes to the top of the face. It uh, supplies sensation for the forehead and the eyelid. Uh, the other branch, and we call that branch V1. Okay. The other branch goes sort of to the zygomatic, the cheek area. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the nose and the upper lip and the upper teeth. You right. can see here all these branches. Uh, some of them go into the teeth. And then there's a lower branch, which we call V3. And it supplies the jaw, uh, the lower teeth, teeth and the lower part of the, uh, the lip. Right. So this is a condition that involves pain in any of these distributions. Uh, patients can have pain only in their forehead okay. uh, or in their forehead and their upper lip or in their entire face oh. on, on one side. Yeah. 
Uh, and because it, it is nerve pain, the scientific term for nerve pain is neuralgia. And therefore, that's where the, the name comes from. Trigeminal neuralgia. Neuralgia. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Very good. Uh, and so are those, 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 those zones are basically where you would feel the pain and know whether or not you were feeling it from which branch of the trigeminal nerve? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, you typically, it typically involves pain that is unilateral. So yeah. you either have it on the right or the left. Uh, and the pain follows the path of the nerve. Um, and this is not a pain that's that's there all the time. Right. You have, it is what we call paroxysmal, which means that it happens in certain intervals. So right. you can have the pain and it and can last it for seconds or minutes, then it goes away. But during back. that time, right, and it can come back. And, and yeah. what can trigger it um, varies. It could be chewing. It could be uh, being out in the cold weather. Mm -hmm. um, it could be just something brushing up against someone's uh, cheek. I got to tell you, it sounds a lot like a toothache. That sounds a very much like what was happening with the toothache. It's uh, like the nerves are in the same area, too. Their nerves are in the same area. So a lot of times it is confused for a toothache. Mm -hmm. Uh, or sometimes a dental procedure uh, that irritates the nerve uh, can lead to this chronic on-off pain uh, condition. That makes sense. Um, and it can be it can be very very painful. It can be severely painful. That in the past, before we had good treatment for it. <laughs> It drove people crazy. It drove some people to suicide. Oh, yeah. that's why they call it the suicide disease, too, because I did see that. It was like there are a few names for it. They called it suicide disease, father gills disease, and tic douloureux, which I guess is a French name for uh I've got a tick in my face that is really ripping it up. I have no idea. <laughs> tick douloureux. That's that's up. Uh, that's that's the French word for it. It's an old word for it. Okay. Um, but yeah, thankfully, no one these days calls it the suicide disease anymore, yeah. uh, because we have much better treatment for it. Okay. Um, but but the pain can be excruciating without a doubt. Okay. All right. So uh, because it's so rare, I'm going to ask you this, but don't feel bad if you, you're going to tell me no. Have you treated a few people with uh, trigeminal neuralgia? Yeah, of course. The, oh, okay. um, and it, it's, it's rare, but again, when, these, pe when the, these patients present, it's something that requires intervention pretty quickly just because they're in severe discomfort so uh yes yes we we have seen several patients with this condition good excellent that's excellent so when they come to you do you write how do you know for sure that that's what it is all right are they saying to you i'm having this this stabbing pain how do they describe it just so if you ever have this pain audience members you might be able to say you know what i might not need to go and see Dr. Misios, the neurosurgeon, to have my trigeminal neuralgia looked up. Uh, the in in most cases they describe it like uh, an ice pick type pain, uh, being uh, you know sort of someone is jabbing their head with an ice oh, pick. Wow. Um, so yeah, they're very very colorful, very severe uh, descriptions. Uh, this is a condition where the majority of the diagnosis is made by history alone. So by interviewing the patients and uh, just fig figuring it out based on their symptoms. Uh, an MRI is always done because you want to be able to see the nerve. This is a nerve that you can see as it comes out of the brain on the MRI. 
and you you're getting the MRI for two main reasons. One is to make sure that there's nothing else that's pushing into the nerve, like a tumor, for example. Oh, okay, that would make okay. sense. Okay. Because treatment for that would be completely different. Okay. Uh, and the other thing you're looking for is, believe it or not, many times there is a blood vessel uh, right next to the nerve. Ooh. And as the blood vessel pulsates with its heartbeat, it can compress the nerve or sort of bruise the nerve enough to cause this pain. That is one of the theories, um, I would say more, more than theory, you know, that's one of the, the causes of this condition. Okay. You still there? Yeah, what are you looking up? I was looking, I was actually looking for an MRI that would put it up, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to. No, no, we'll, we'll show, we'll, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll show one when we talk about the treatment. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Go ahead. So the, the, when patients present with this condition, the first thing that uh, is being done in terms of an intervention is trying to treat this with medicines. And okay. the medicines that work well for these conditions are some of the medicines are also medicines that have been used to treat seizures, okay. uh, which is going to sound uh, really, really strange or counterintuitive. But yeah. the truth is, seizures are caused by nerve movement or movement along the nerve, uh, I guess. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't describe it in, in that fashion. No, just no, just no. suffice to say that, that anti seizure medicine work on the nerves and they can change the electrical activity of nerves to prevent seizures, but at the same time uh, a side effect of some some of these seizure medicines is uh, decreasing the amount of nerve pain. And and that's exactly uh, the types of seizure medicines that are used for this condition um, have that benefit of decreasing the amount of nerve pain. So that's that's the first line treatment. Okay. And in a lot of cases, it works fine and patients have to remain on that medicine for a long time to, to prevent these attacks from happening. Okay. Um, but every once in a while, these medicines are not enough and patients can have what we call breakthrough episodes mm. and that's when we start considering different interventions different surgical options for treatment of this uh, of this condition okay uh you're saying that you couldn't just dampen it with these medications like you're talking about you're talking about sometimes medication. you can sometimes yeah. you can but not always oh, yeah so so in that case you're switching over to some something a little bit more invasive you're saying correct all right all right okay uh and what would that be i mean i know you're a you're a huge um proponent of you, you know this is one of the first things you spoke to me about when you were like listen we're gonna get our marketing done stereotactic radio surgery i was like right away <laughs> i was like okay well, i have to go and figure that out and figure out what it is and do the yeah. research on it and I assume this is one of those? Uh, there are three main types of treatments for this condition. Okay. Uh, they vary in the degree of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So some treatments are more effective than others. Uh, some treatments are more invasive than others. Okay. Uh, and when to recommend which treatment to patients, that's where the art of medicine comes in. And it depends on the patient and it depends on how old they are. Um, and it depends on how, how invasive of a procedure they would like to uh, undergo. So the, I'm going to share my screen again, if you don't okay. mind.
So the first type of uh, procedure is a, is a surgical procedure. And it's a procedure that is called a microvascular decompression. And remember we said that a lot of times there is a blood vessel next to the nerve. Okay. And the pulsations of that blood vessel uh, can affect the nerve. And trigger the pain. And mm-hmm. trigger these symptoms. Yeah, it makes sense. So the concept of this procedure, of this intervention is to actually dissect and find the nerve what find the blood vessel uh find the nerve right at the point where it exits the brain okay find the blood vessel and try to separate the blood vessel from the nerve now doc, how, do we, how do we do that doc that has to be tiny uh, that has, the, the, the micro, micro, the precision that must be required for this. This is not, I wouldn't even think about, this is why people used to just drill people in the head, right? Back in the day. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it does involve drilling <laughs> and it does involve uh, using, uh, doing the dissection under the microscope. Okay. Uh, because yes, things can, things are very small. <laughs> These structures are very small. Yeah. Um, so it does require significant uh, precision. Okay. Um, but let me go back to that picture. Yeah, did I see a sponge in there? I mean... You did. So it, it involves... The area where you go in is behind the ear. Okay. Uh, this, this shows the exposure on the right side. And typically it's a linear incision and it's a small opening in the skull that allows you to go down there where the nerve comes out of the brain. Okay. The brain would be here on this side. Mm -hmm. And then you find the blood vessels and you separate them from the nerve. And in order to insulate the nerve, because if you just separate them, the blood vessel is just going to come back to its original position. Uh, okay. You put in a piece of uh, synthetic material okay. uh, to damp to to protect the nerve and to dampen those pulsations, and that material is typically made out of uh, Teflon. Teflon. Think, yeah, think of it like putting a, like uh, wrapping the nerve in uh, in Teflon to protect it from the blood vessel. Yeah, it's, it sounds crazy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, now and, you've got a bulletproof blood vessel. And <laughs> probably nerve. and probably the first time that this was ever tried, yeah. uh, it was a pretty significant leap of faith, but uh, it works very, very well. And this is actually the most effective way we have of uh, treating this condition. Okay. And um, this is a, another picture shows oh, the back oh. the back of someone's head where they go and find the nerve where right this is out. from the the mayfield clinic uh-huh. is in cincinnati and they have a, a long tradition and history in doing this procedure so okay. they have a lot of material out and that's where we we got that to, okay. to give that to give them credit so make sure to give them a citation at the end of the show okay of course <laughs> uh and this is the the the, the back of the skull and what is outlined here are some very large veins which we call the sinuses and this shows in a dotted line the incision it can be a straight incision up and down it can look like that but the circle uh, denotes the area where uh, the bone is removed okay this is another view where so what's under here right well if what's under here is the part of the brain that we call the cerebellum right the cerebellum is involved in coordination uh it is involved in balance and essentially we are separating the cerebellum from the bone we're kind of as they as the arrow shows we're we're moving in front of the cerebellum because that's where the nerves are wow and this is another view. This is sort of the view that we have uh, under the microscope, where uh, on the bottom is the cerebellum, 
and you see the nerve coming out and you see this artery that's very close to it and the all this white stuff is uh it looks like a spider's web and it's called the arachnoid membrane and the arachnoid is a n- normal membrane that coats the brain the nerves the the arteries and we separate all that spider web material uh and then in order to prevent the vessel from going back to its original position uh a piece of teflon is placed it's put in there now a common question is what keeps the teflon in place right um why doesn't the teflon just float away and move and you know it depends on the how big of a piece you put and how you put it and how you anchor it in place but normally there's not a lot of movement here okay you know you have movement in your head but not in this particular location i tell you it looks like a very tight space like a space that you would very very uh you would be unlikely to see something moving around in there and you know you're <laughs> every time you send me an image to put on your website <laughs> and i see it it looks nothing like that that's a nice clean image the truth is there's going to be a lot of blood around that area or fluid around that area oh yeah yeah in it you know hold things in place once you've yeah. closed up the area yes it will cause some scarring yes yeah yeah, yeah. it's going to cause a little so scarring. this is a procedure again it, it, it is very effective at mm-hmm. alleviating uh the facial pain um but not everybody is willing or uh, it's not indicated for everybody because sometimes patients can be elderly right they can be on uh, blood thinners mm-hmm. for example they can have a lot of medical conditions that doesn't allow them uh that don't allow them to undergo such an invasive uh, procedure right so that would be um, a good idea for them okay right so it's not the only way to deal with this condition okay all right cool all right so uh you the other two then you said there were other two two other ways two other ways and the second way that is very near and dear to my heart is this and what are we looking at here this is not a piece of science fiction (laughs) um this is a machine that delivers radiation and radiation can be delivered uh to the brain in two main ways uh and one way involves a very focused delivery of radiation meaning that we can deliver radiation to a very tiny space uh in a very very focused fashion you you know what's interesting to me that you're showing the image that does kind of look like science fiction do you have the other one where the, the actual machine machine yeah. in the room because every time there you go because yeah. every time i see this i think to myself they must suspend this person in the middle of the room and then this giant thing is spinning around in that uh, around them taking doing whatever it's supposed to be doing so there's different way so th- this type of radiation delivery is called stereotactic radio surgery right and that is a term that means a very focused delivery of radiation into the brain okay as opposed to radiating the entire brain for example right right um the advantage of giving a very focal uh delivery of radiation is that you can give a lot of radiation in a very tiny space without a lot of that radiation spilling over to the normal brain and causing side effects right uh and this is one of the machines that does this radiation uh this is uh, the type of machine is called a varian uh true beam that's the model name mm-hmm. think of it like we're describing a car and one car can yeah. be a so this is a toyota, toyota this right. another car can be a mercedes another car i mean right 
you know, there's different machines that do stereotactic yeah, radio right, surgery right, right. with small differences among them, but for the most part, they're very similar. Yeah. Is, and this, the, is this the Bentley of the stereotactic radio surgery machine? Yeah, well, see, that's that's the, that's the trick when you, when you're using the the uh, analogy of uh, cars, cars. <laughs> that that some cars are more expensive than others. Right, right? exactly, and yeah. they have more features. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and and to a certain extent, there are machines that have more features than others, but okay. but they're all for the most part very similar. Okay, um, so the where the, the patient sits in the middle on a special bed, which is right here. Okay. Uh, and then in the case of the variant, the the machine turns around the patient. So this okay. can turn 360, okay. and it can deliver radiation from so all that, different angles. So that does answer my question in that it basically is a huge machine that is spinning on this axis attached to the wall. Right. Wow. And, I, and that's what you can see here. You can see it spinning. And of course, the radiation is invisible. Mm -hmm. You don't see it. Right, right, right. But what this is supposed to show is right. how, you know, it can make uh, an arc that's almost 360 degrees, so it can deliver radiation all along different right. trajectories. Right. This is the sci-fi version. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, how does the machine know where the patient is? Okay. Uh, this is uh, this is sort of what the patient looks like that is undergoing this procedure. And they they are on this special special table or bed whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, and they're wearing a very special mask. And this mask is uh, shaped to uh, match and fit the patient's face, and the machine reads uh, the contours of this mask, and then it translates that into the MRI, and that's how it knows where the patient is in space. Are you watching this the entire time from some other kind of thing, or is this basically automated? You like you tell it where to go, it maps it to the part of whatever you know the net is on its head, and then it just does it. Or are you guiding it and making sure that this actually happens? Uh, a little bit of both. So the there is a lot of uh, work that is done ahead of time mm -hmm. and planning. Yes. And a lot of uh, uh, quality controls before its treatment. That would make sense. The, treat the treatment itself is largely automated, but it is uh, always supervised uh, to make sure that everything goes well. Okay. All right. Uh, and then, you know, when I said that there's a lot of planning, so the patient undergoes a CAT scan, uh, an MRI, and then all that information goes into a computer and then the target in, in this case the target is the uh, trigeminal nerve is selected and careful calculations are made and what we see here is the trigeminal nerve is right here and right here you can see the arrows the up and down arrows Wow. And that's kind of that that's where you want to focus the radiation, right? Okay. Now, uh, the radiation, you have some control over it. Uh but but some of it, even though this is a very focused radiation, a, a small amount will spill yes beyond the confines of the radiation. Think of it like like a like an egg sunny side up right. and, and your yolk is the target, but the white stuff is going to spread. Yeah. To a little bit. All right. To a little bit. So yeah. how it spreads, you can control that. Right. So this is the brain stuff. Yeah. Okay. So you do not want any radiation here. Hitting that, of course. Because... So, and you can see what they did here is they shaped the radiation. So very little, if any, goes into the brain stem. And it goes into different places. Like this area here is bone. Right. You know, there's there's no brain here. So so that can accept more radiation. This, this is going to be a weird question to ask you, I guess, because it's not really directly related to neurosurgery. 
But with a delivery system like that, shouldn't it be easier or more accurate to remove people's, for example, cancer cells if you were hitting them with directly that kind of uh, radiation on exactly wherever they're, you know, maybe they had a smaller tumor that they, you know, you don't want to irradiate someone's entire brain or someone's entire breast or someone's entire leg, but you want to get it right where you want it. Wouldn't this be like the perfect delivery system for that? Well, it, it, it is, and, and it is used to treat cancer um, very, very frequently. Okay. Uh, and when it comes to the brain, you can treat tumors very effectively. And, and we can talk about that in a different in a well, different episode. Exactly. exactly. Uh, in however, detail. however, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, if you are looking for information on stereotactic radio surgery, we have a whole uh, carousel on that on Dr. Mizios's um, as Instagram. And we'll do one for trigeminal um, neuralgia, too. Okay. But but uh, there's definitely one on there for stereotactic radio surgery, how it works, what we use it for. I think that's one of the first ones I did because, you know, it came to me about that. And it is on at Simeon Missios MD on Instagram. Uh, same thing on Facebook. Uh, I don't know if we're on Twitter yet. We should, we should be on Twitter. But at Simeon, <laughs> <laughs> at Simeon Missios MD for sure. Okay. Um the shameless plug right it, it is what it is <laughs> now uh, third you said i think you said there were third three ways so um stereotactic radio surgery so it works um it doesn't work as well as okay. the microvascular decompression mm -hmm. but it is less invasive yeah, it's okay. an out, it's an outpatient procedure mm -hmm. nobody cuts into your brain Okay. You don't have to spend any time in the hospital, uh, and it works with an effect with a pretty decent effectiveness to to warrant uh, recommending this treatment. So definitely, this is a treatment. Um, a lot of times, people who are elderly, people who are not suited to undergo a craniotomy, a brain surgery. Okay. Uh, that that is certainly a very very good option to try, and that's something that uh, that we we have we can definitely perform. We we have the technology available uh, in our hospital. We uh, have the technology. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just just doing my six million dollar man impression. Yeah, we could get it done. Is it expensive? Uh, well, it is something that is covered by all insurances right. so okay. um, right. you know right. it, it, is it expensive probably mm -hmm. is it expensive for the patient not really okay um this is the third option which which is also i'm sure looks very very strange mm -hmm. um, but there is another way to try to dampen the pain that comes from this nerve is to stick a needle in it uh, mm -hmm. And it is. It sounds very weird because yes. <laughs> this nerve comes out of the skull uh, and spreads into the to the face. face. The so how do you even target it? Yeah. There is a way you can target it uh, with a needle, and that's called percutaneously. And essentially, it it looks like this, where the needle goes through the cheek yeah all the way to the back yeah and obviously you know it doesn't doesn't sound like fun this oh, is you want to be asleep for this one this this is done <laughs> with, with with some anesthesia i have seen these done on an awake person as what? well what uh with with very light anesthesia and you know it's a, it can be a challenge mm. um this is a, a, a schematic uh, it just shows the bones but again this shows the trajectory of kind of where you go and uh, you you hit the 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 body of the nerve this is a close up um the the big and, and you enter the nerve through the the third division through v3 okay uh but you want to end up in the area where all three divisions 
kind of blend together. And this is an area that has a name. It's called the trigeminal ganglion. Mm -hmm. uh, right next to it, this big red thing is the carotid artery. Yeah, so okay. you you do what? not want to you do not want to hit that. Okay? So no. What, however, why? Why not? Uh, <laughs> let me just ask you. Because why wouldn't we want to hit the carotid? People artery? can die from yeah. bleeding. That okay? is the most. It, it 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 is probably the largest or second largest vein that's running into your head right? well it's an it's an artery it's not yeah, a vein artery, so exactly. it takes blood from the heart to the brain right. when it comes to the brain that's the biggest uh, blood supply to the yeah. brain so, so if you if you nick that guy um, it's pretty much over you got it's, to... a, it's a stroke you yeah. know um, uh so what happens after you when you get into the nerve so there are three ways uh, people have injected material into the nerve mm -hmm. um that is essentially toxic to the nerve uh and it can help decrease the pain wow what what these people here are doing is they are inflating a balloon inside the nerve so that balloon is crushing the nerve and believe it or not that can help with the pain and what they're doing here is this device is uh, something called a radio frequency probe so it can burn parts of the nerve and that so essentially injuring the nerve in different ways whether it's chemical mechanical or heat um, can help decrease the pain so we're the, basically the, saying we would prefer to just kill that nerve and lose sensation maybe even motion even you, you, you don't want you don't want to kill the nerve you don't want to cut the nerve okay. because um people can still have pain like phantom pain after that Afterwards. and then they'll have severe numbness of their face so exactly. that's what i was uh, by doing these procedures you can uh, de decrease the frequency of the pain they are um, people who do them on a regular basis uh you know it is it, it's not as morbid as it sounds um and the downside is that the effectiveness of these procedures can be short lasting meaning that mm. you can get a year or two of relief and then the pace then the symptoms right. could, could right. come back right because your body is saying there's a there's something weird in here or there's something broken in here and it might actually try to heal itself yes yeah yeah, yeah. And yeah. so in literally basically bring back the pain because it's reconnecting the the, the thing. Wow, that's that's that would be a problem. And, and it, you talk about having an ice pick stuck into your face because you're saying that that's what the pain is like. But in a way that poking straight through it, that's how you fix it, too. That's that's interesting. We're like, OK, that's that's what you call an eye for an eye or an ice pick for an ice pick. That's that's serious. OK. All right, so those are definitely three ways that you could stop trigeminal neuralgia. And if you think you've had it, it's usually because you're having this poking, this facial, facial stuff going in there. That's wild. Man. It's hard to miss. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you're saying it's hard to miss. That, this is a great understatement. This is like doctor saying, now you're going to feel a little <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I saw this when we were talking about the show. I said, okay, let me go and check to see if we have any recent uh, news or articles about trigeminal neuralgia. And I did see this where it says, uh, this is um, multiple sclerosis news today. And they were basically saying, you know, they just said more than 3% of patients. This is not the whole world of patients, people. They're speaking specifically 3% of multiple sclerosis patients, which is very interesting because that's a much larger um, percentage of their population than we were talking about before. It's this very rare symptom, but for whatever reason, they're saying that it affects multiple sclerosis people much more. Now, Doc, do you think you have any idea? Well, let me, let me very quickly, it says trigeminal neuralgia, a chronic pain condition characterized by shocks or burning sensations in the face. We know that already. Um, seems to be much more common among people with MS mm -hmm. than in the general population, according to a review of published studies. And it see, also says it's more prevalent in women with MS than it is in men. Now, 
that's kind of silly because when I was reading before and doing some some research on the subject, trigeminal neuralgia in general is more common in women than it is in men. Yes, that's true. Okay. Um, we don't have a good explanation why. No, do, yeah, your face, the women's faces are probably just <laughs> more sensitive to things than, than they are. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find the year two, three thousand. We'll figure that out. But yeah, they're saying that it seems that the neuropathic pain, which is caused by damage to the nerves that carry signals between the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the rest of the body. Um, is similar to something that MS patients who often experience that. So, um, Doc, why do you think that this is related and or more possible for them to have this, people who are already suffering from MS? Yeah, so um, this is entirely correct. The, uh, there is a higher incidence of trigeminal neuralgia among patients with multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. um, it is also the symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia are much harder to treat uh, among patients who have multiple sclerosis. They, mm -hmm. they seem to respond not as well to the interventions. Um, the, the reason for that has to do with if you think of what multiple sclerosis is. Mm -hmm. So multiple sclerosis affects the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, and essentially your own immune system gets confused and instead of fighting off your B cells who produce the antibodies, instead of them producing antibodies to viruses and bacteria, they produce antibodies to viruses, bacteria, and also to uh, a chemical that insulates your nerves uh, that chemical is called myelin uh, so they they cause your nerves to become uh they cause the insulation to fall off the nerves in different areas in random areas of the brain and spinal cord uh and it, nerves that are not insulated with myelin they don't conduct the signal very well. Uh, also, they cause that can cause inflammation. So some of the nerves can get destroyed in that process. Mm. So where that happens is completely random. And if it happens close to the areas where the, uh, where the facial sensation is perceived, then that can lead to a mixed signal or a, a, a loss of the signal, which can translate into numbness, burning, and pain. If you think about it, you know, the trigeminal nerve, it, it carries sensation, but it, it doesn't just get into the brain and end there. It gets into the brain and then that signal gets bounced around in the brainstem. Then it goes up higher into the thalamus and then it gets to the cortex, to the brain, to the surface of the brain. Okay. And that's how we perceive sensation. And anywhere along that pathway, multiple sclerosis can hit the nerves uh. and it can cause an alteration in the signal. You uh. don't lose the signal. I mean, you, right. could, you could lose the signal and get numbness or the signal can be messed up right and and that can be perceived as pain right so it is you know it is something that it's it's unpredictable right so not everybody with multiple sclerosis gets this no uh, right. but de depending where the multiple sclerosis hits people can develop this right, right. now if you are on medicines for multiple sclerosis uh, Typically, the medicines are immunosuppressive. They, they attack. They act against the B cells for the most part. Um, and you don't have any flare-ups. You're not going to run into this. Okay. Um, but uh, that's that's the association. Okay. Very interesting. All right. So yeah, it's it. I guess it's it makes it more more or less un difficult 
to actually treat, more difficult to to and obviously more uh, more prevalent in this particular group of people. More All complicated, right. yeah. Yeah, complicated. All right. So, ladies and gents, um, I think. We've covered it all, right, Doc? Do you have anything else? I think so. Uh, I mean, got there. once the episode is out, you know, <laughs> it would be great to, you know, get questions about this. But, but, uh, okay. uh, yeah, but yeah. that's, um, you know, I hope this was a it was helpful, right? Helpful and a decent enough summary that uh, that people would for understand. patients for patients who hear this term and they want to figure out what what it is. Right. Or, or have this pain. Or have this condition. Pain. Absolutely. Right, right. And then want to know exactly how they can take care of themselves. So regardless, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I do want to um, I do want to welcome you, invite you to go to Dr. Macias' website where there's lots of information about all kinds of neurological uh, and brain disorders, uh, you, you go check it out. We've got brain information on brain conditions, spine conditions. Um, see, like I told you, that's his big thing, stereotypes, radio associated, and of course, advanced neuroimaging techniques as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for being with us. Doc, again, thank you for all of the wonderful information, the, the fantastic info, uh, and hopefully um, we'll do this again and see uh we'll, hopefully we'll get some 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 feedback definitely looking forward to that no it'd be nice to get some feedback yeah. and um uh, you know uh, and people will, know it, whether it, or not they're, they're they're interested in in knowing more about the neurological it, situation yeah so, and it can help us uh in terms of trying to come up with topics and, uh, right exactly right. yeah right. yeah so we're yeah. not talking about like telepathy or whatever else we were talking about Qu it. quackery quackery <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> like that 1938 article that we saw I, I was researching for this people and uh the 1938 article was like stick water into the person's face to get rid of trigeminal neurology and i was like really <laughs> would, would that work it's like hot water going into the face it probably would help them for a while right but then eventually that would go away well it depends where you're sticking the yeah. water <laughs> um <laughs> you know th this uh, well i guess the, the 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 theory is similar to these percutaneous approaches where you're getting close to the nerve and you're trying to harm the nerve Right. Uh, in this case, by injecting hot water. But, <laughs> you know, I hate to tell you, in the 30s, you wouldn't know where that needle was going. No, no. And so, <laughs> you know, in the 30s, I mean, we, we should have an episode on quackery. You well, know? <laughs> we will. We Just be, will. Because in the 30s, I'm sure, like, you know, they would do that. And if they hit the carotid and injected hot water, patients would die. And... <laughs> Horrible you know, have. and probably not even help them. You know, and probably not even help them. Yeah, wow, it is what it is. But yeah, there is, I, there is another. There's another condition where there's another uh, treatment where they were trying to treat uh, psychiatric problems. Because mm. um, you know, it's, it's, the psychiatry and quackery are, right. are go hand in hand in the 1800s be careful now <laughs> no 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 i mean in, i know in, what you mean i know what you mean I'm just in, the, in the in the 1800s right, right, right. where they would uh uh remove uh, all the teeth from a patient uh thinking because the the theory was that psychiatric diseases originated from a tooth infection really so you would get a tooth infection. This is like in the late 1800s, yeah, early right, 1900s. Right. You'd get a, a dental infection and then it would go into your brain and it would make you crazy. So they would remove someone's teeth, all upper and lower teeth. Yeah. It's horrible. Because, and, and I, 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 I kind of understand, you know, if you're if you're a complete and total lay person, you know nothing about science. You're in the 1800s because technically you know nothing about science if it's the 1800s, right? I know more than the, the, some of those doctors from back then, and you literally are saying, "Huh? When I get a 
toothache. It hurts and it goes all the way up into my brain. So yeah, it's probably the teeth that caused me to go crazy. You know what I mean? They're, they took it literally and probably did what they thought they could do with the information they have. Wow. And you know, real, you realize that in a thousand years, they're going they're to be, be saying the same about us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's Star Trek. That's a, that's for another conversation. You know, they're going to be like those those clowns were radiating yeah, people's yeah, yeah, brain. Yeah. I remember uh, there was an episode of Star Trek where uh, Doctor McCoy comes to Earth and something happens to somebody and they get taken away to a hospital and he's like those quacks <laughs> they go, no those butchers that's what he said i was like oh snap and so this is the 1970s maybe 1980s this particular it was a, i think it was a movie like they had to come back from the to to they came back in whale. time yeah 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 exactly they had to come back and say whales or whatever else because whales would make us live blah, blah, blah. i think that's uh don't do it don't Star Trek Four. I think that's Star Trek Four. Uh, don't do it. You you are gonna get the Trekkies and the Trekkers all over us. Be careful. <laughs> but yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'll, it's write, four. I'll write it in the citations at the bottom. Doctor I'm more of a next generation guy. <laughs> Me too. Trekker. You're a Trekker versus a Trekkie. But oh, it, it that. Is, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's the distinction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. John Luke Picard is my guy. I'm sorry. I understand. The, the the appeal of Captain Kirk, but I'm sorry. John Luke Picard and Worf all day, every day. Yes? Lieutenant Commander Worf. All right. Good doc. I, like, I like data to be honest with you. <laughs> you like data? Well, I can understand that too. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> logic there. And uh, he was always working on his brain. I remember repeatedly they're opening up the, the his head to figure whatever else is going on in there him and the lore and whatever else all right let's stop being on, the, on, on that note <laughs> <laughs> all right ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for hanging out with us on brainstorm episode four all about trigeminal neuralgia and thank you so much doc thank you ryan have a good all night right.